So this month we have been looking at the concept of good and goodness and what that looks like within our Christian tradition, right? In our tradition, the Bible is the good book, the good news. Jesus is the good shepherd. The church is the good community. Interestingly, good is symbolically portrayed in many ways in our Bibles. Good can be a place, such as heaven. It could be a time, such as Christ's return, either Christ's return in the final days or Christ's return in our own hearts as an expression of love. Or good can be a person, such as Jesus, or, or good can be God. Have you ever thought about God as that, as God as a symbolic representation of good? That's kind of similar to what Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark and Luke when Jesus says, only God is good. Right? A man comes up to Jesus, says to him, good teacher. And Jesus looks at him and says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And this is the simplest biblical definition of good in the Bible. That God is good and that only God is good. So the closest we humans, and that, within that definition, the closest we humans can come to being good is to do God's will. Or is to engage in God's plan. God's plan of love for God and love for neighbor. Humankind can join in God's goodness by doing God's will or by doing what God would do or what, doing what Jesus would do in each situation. Doing God's will or following God's law is another classic biblical definition of good. The problem with the simple definition is that God's will is always up for debate among us humans. And even worse, humans have a long history of using the claim that something is God's will to justify or as justification for carrying out some very bad and very evil deeds. Both religious and secular leaders have found that entire countries can be convinced to do frightening, irrational, and outrageous things if they're convinced that it's God's will to do so. So it's just saying something is God's will, maybe that's not enough. And thankfully, the Bible or the good news gives us much more than just that to go on through its stories and its prophetic sources as well. The Bible gives us things to watch for as indicators of what is good, indicators of what is God's will, and how we can tell if God's will is indeed being done. The prophetic sources, the books in the Old Testament named after the most famous biblical prophets, often focus on our treatment of the poor as a measure of goodness. Today we heard from the book of Amos, representing the prophetic tradition on this question of goodness and what it means to do God's will. Now, remember, Amos was the earliest prophet, the first prophet to predict the destruction of the chosen people or the destruction of the good people, as they thought of themselves. The good people or the chosen people were not supposed to ever, ever lose a war. And that's exactly what Amos predicts. The reason for the destruction of God's chosen people, Amos tells them, is they've upset God. They're not doing God's will in a very specific area. They're treating the poor improperly. They're treating the weak unfairly. In Amos, the Bible provides us with another measurement for goodness, a, a way of assessing what is good. The problem, according to Amos, is not a violation of belief or a problem with what individuals were thinking or attesting about God. Instead, the violation was a community-wide denial of basic human rights, of a right to fair treatment in the market, fair treatment in court, and a right to a roof over your head, and a, and a right to food. Amos has an issue with how the wealthier, more powerful people of Israel were treating the poor among them. So Amos tells us directly to hate evil and love good by establishing justice in the city, particularly for the poor, because the poor who are most frequently denied justice. 
So here in the Old Testament, evil is being defined by Amos as bad treatment of the poor or more generically, bad treatment of those at the bottom of society's power structures. The prophetic focus on the treatment of the poor and the downtrodden as a measure of goodness is later expanded and extended in the New Testament. Jesus spoke of justice for the poor often, so did Paul. We reference what Jesus taught us in Matthew 25 about the least of these a lot. We talk about the least of these. Jesus taught us that how we treat the least of these, the poor, the hungry, the sick, the stranger, is how we treat Jesus. Treatment of the poor is a reliable measure of the greatest commandment to love God and love neighbor. How can you tell if your society, if your culture is loving God and loving neighbor? Look at the poor. Look at the outcast. Look at the immigrant. You'll be able to tell there. Paul also deals with the idea of goodness from the standpoint of our actions and community. To Paul, someone is good. If you're good, Paul says, you're going to live in harmony with one another. No matter what they believe, even if they disagree with it, you're still going to be able to live in harmony with them. Paul does not talk about justice for the poor directly in this letter, but instead he calls on us to live in community with those who we look down on. Paul instructs the church to associate with the lowly. It's really important that we understand this. While Amos seemed to indicate that being fair to the lowly is what is good, Paul takes a step further and says, in addition to being fair, that we're to be in relationship with the lowly, the least of these, the people who society might tend to look down on, who are often, who are often classically poor. poor. Paul advises us to have a healthy relationship with the lowly, not because it's correct belief, but rather because the poor are part of us too. The poor and the lowly are just as much God's children as anyone else, as we are. Sometimes the biggest thing that's lowly about others is our judgments and our prejudices. The treatment of others as lowly is a spiritual disease, one that can be treated through relationship with the lowly, with those who we think are lowly. Associating with the lowly is about healing our arrogance, in addition to learning how to be good news for the poor. Paul wants us to seek positive and productive relationships with the lowly rather than distancing ourselves from them. And if associating with the people who are considered lonely does not increase our compassion, if it doesn't change who we are in more loving ways and make us more understanding, Maybe we're not ready for that step yet. Some of us need to work on our ability to love our neighbor first before we can have a productive relationship with those that we look down on. Then Paul writes, never return evil for evil. Never return evil. This is powerful and difficult. And it shows Paul's spiritual depth. It's okay to return good for good. It's okay to return good for evil. It's not okay to return evil for evil. These are important words that push against conventional wisdom in several ways. The traditional solution when someone does wrong to you is to do wrong to them back, right? I mean, they deserve it, don't they? And there seems to be support for this idea of justice as retribution, in Old Testament biblical law. For example, Exodus 21, 24 says that harm should be addressed eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot. I don't know about you, that sure sounds like returning evil for evil to me. And in fact, it's been read that way by many people throughout history. But Jesus directly rejects this eye for an eye interpretation in Matthew 538 he says you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth you've heard that but I say to you 
Do not resist an evildoer, but anyone who strikes you on the right cheek, turn the left also. Clearly, both Jesus and Paul taught that an eye for an eye or evil for evil, while maybe biblical, is not really the way of Christ. It's not really the way of love. Some scholars feel that the purpose of this Old Testament passage about an eye for an eye was not prescriptive. It wasn't to prescribe punishment, but to limit it. Because too often, the traditions of their time meant that ancient people would respond to any sort of disrespect with way more violence and way more evil than was done to them in the first place. So an eye for an eye was setting a cap. No more. If you've got to do no more than an eye for an eye, that's the maximum. If you feel you have to seek retribution, if you don't want to leave that to the Lord, you don't trust God enough, you don't love neighbor enough, you must, if you must return evil for evil, at least limit the evil. Mercy's better, though. Forgiveness is better than an eye for an eye. But returning evil for evil is definitely easy to understand and unfortunately very easy for us humans to carry out. And by the way, the outcome is always the same. When we fight evil with evil, only evil can win. Think about that. If you fight evil with evil, evil's going to win. Good is no longer in the picture. Fighting evil with good requires the ability to deal with evil without doing evil ourselves in the process. Jesus exemplified this ability to desire good for those who do evil to us as he hung from the cross. Did Jesus condemn those who were torturing him to death? Did Jesus exact God's retribution on them? No. Jesus asked for forgiveness. For those who abused and killed him, Jesus prayed, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Jesus didn't call for an eye for an eye. But instead, Jesus modeled grace, mercy, and forgiveness for us all to see and hopefully understand. In today's scripture reading from the Romans, Paul says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul says, Never avenge yourself, right? Never an eye for an eye. Never avenge yourself, but if possible, so far it depends on you, live peaceably for all, with all. If your enemy, if the one abuses you is hungry, what are you supposed to do? Feed them. If your enemy is thirsty, should you deny them drink? No. Paul says, give them water. Importantly, returning good for evil does not mean that you have to subject yourself to repeated abuse. Returning, returning good for evil does not mean allowing more evil to be done. Once you've turned the other cheek to an abuser, that does not mean you need to show up tomorrow for more abuse. It's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is actually talking about shame to deal with evil. But he says it in kind of a cryptic way. Paul says that returning good for evil, you'll reap burning coals on your enemies' heads. Hot burning coals on their heads. What? <laughs> burning coals on their heads? <sighs> Heaping burning whole coals on someone's head sure sounds like repaying evil to evil to me. Why would Paul write so precisely about not returning evil for evil, and then turn around and suggest the very same thing that he just a sentence prior and a sentence afterwards speaks against. <laughs> well, the problem is our tendency to take the hot coals concept literally. The phrase heap hot coals on their heads is symbolic. It was a phrase used in ancient times to describe shame. Heaping burning coals on someone's head was a Greek expression that referred to a deep sense of shame and remorse. 
The shame that can come when someone else treats us like an enemy and we turn around and treat them with kindness. Now, I'm not a big fan of shame, but I do understand that there are times when shame can bring about positive change. And in those instances, it can be a good thing. So what can we glean from all this today? Well, Paul was a church builder. Amos was a prophet of destruction dark of destruction and doom. Yet they both teach us what it means to be good in very useful ways. Amos teaches us that God takes injustice and bad treatment of the poor, the hungry, and the outcast very seriously. That we can actually measure the goodness of our culture and of society by looking how the people at the bottom are treated. And Paul takes that a step further to stress the importance of building good relationships with others, including not just the lowly, but even our enemies. Paul teaches us that it's good to live in harmony with each other. That it's important to disrupt the cycle of evil that we can become trapped in by seeking vengeance against each other, which leads to more vengeance and more violence, and it goes on and on. Essentially, every war that's being fought fits into that category, not to mention the fights between you and I that occur between us peoples. Paul's experience of Jesus Christ and the prophetic words of Amos both point us in the same general direction. And notice that neither Paul nor Amos is focused on heaven and on hell. For Amos, God's judgment was immediate, and involves suffering in this world, not the next. For Paul, it was more about his, the experience he had with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. How that experience had changed his outlook. How he was now able to live in harmony with others in ways he never had before. How his encounter with Jesus Christ improved his ability to love. And Paul just wanted everybody to have that experience too. So Paul offers practical instructions on good and evil for use in day-to-day life to grow closer to God in this life, not just in the next, because that's what happened to him when he encountered Jesus Christ. I think we see in Paul's writings that if people are already headed in the right direction in terms of following Jesus Christ, hell should not be the main concern. If if hell is our primary concern, if we are driven by fear, our spiritual efforts can devolve to the point that it becomes all about us and whether we're in heaven or not, rather than on us being an expression of love. If we follow Jesus only in order to go to heaven when we die or to avoid going to hell, it can become kind of like cheap and shallow form of faith that's more like fire insurance than a kind of experience of God's grace that Paul had on the road and that I feel that we seek as followers of Jesus Christ. Paul taught people to follow Jesus in the here and now for the sake of experiencing salvation, which is wholeness and healing here and now, and to help others do the same. If we are headed in the wrong direction, however, if we are headed the wrong way, if we're headed away from loving God and loving neighbor, then we do have a big problem to deal with. If we're headed away from God and away from love, bad things will indeed lie at the end of our pathway if we don't change. If we are headed in the right direction, if our spiritual growth is leading us towards loving God and loving neighbor, towards goodness, then worries about hell tend to just fall away from us. We just learn to trust God with that. And if we're not headed in the right direction, and we're worried about hell, the thing to do is change direction. The good news is, is that no matter where we are in life's journey, all it takes is one step to change direction, and another step to continue to move towards love. And as we do, love will cast out fear, And you too may find that heaven and hell become secondary concerns as we seek God's will, as we seek 
to become expressions of love, not just individually, but also as a community.